Hey, what's up guys? My name is Coco from High Street and I wanna welcome you to Church Online. Our mission at High Street is to love God, serve people and reach the world. We hope you enjoy today's content. One of the things that, I don't know if you're like me, uh, I've had to say sorry a lot of times in my life for a variety of reasons, uh, but we, we like it when somebody forgives us, right? And uh, I always think back, I just recently transitioned to working here at the church full time, but I was a elementary school PE teacher, and so I made a mistake one day, and I had, uh, it was a third grade class, I had these boys in there, Jasper and Bo, they're awesome, they're great guys, and uh, so these third graders, they're playing a game, and it's it's called battle pin and what it is is you can't play dodgeball in school anymore so you try and play everything that's kind of like it but not really it and you guys might be sitting up there sitting out there looking at me like oh, he looks like an average athlete but to a third grader I'm Patrick Mahomes okay I need you to understand that and so I would get a little bit carried away sometimes and we're playing battle pin and you're throwing uh, these gator skin these like uh, rubber coated balls across the gym and uh, I, I was chucking them because I got caught up in the moment moment a little bit and I, I was throwing it at these two boys they're like athletes they're into it and stuff and I, I I chunked one right and I threw it hard all right and I hit my man Jasper right in the eyeball and I always thought kids were being a baby when they got hit with one of these until I got hit with one in the eye and it does not feel good and so I nail Jasper in the face with it and man I feel terrible my heart sinks I'm like I got a wife and a kid at home I, I can't lose my job right I can't be getting sued out here and so I'm immediately like my mind goes to where it's like that's it it was a good run of teaching but you know see you later I'm telling my coworkers goodbye but Jasper when I walked up to him like he was crying he's upset but he forgave me and I'll never forget that. Like, I bought him a bag of chips at lunch. I was like, here you go, buddy. Everything's good now. I almost blinded you for the rest of your life, but I bought you a bag of ruffles, so it's okay. <laughs> but I, I'll never forget, like, the forgiveness of a child. And that, that really, like, just stuck with me a whole lot. And, you know, it doesn't matter what you've done. Maybe it's something jokingly like that that isn't that serious, could have been serious, but isn't that serious. Or maybe you've done something before and you've had to ask for forgiveness and uh, it just felt good that somebody forgave you for what you did. And uh, that is something that we all long for. But I see something that's happening in our culture and it's not with one group of people, it's with everybody. It's our tendency, I think, as sinful human people is that when somebody makes a mistake, when somebody messes up, when someone has done something in their past, we label them as their mistake. There is no opportunity for reconciliation, no matter what the condition of, is of their heart. And let me be honest, like, when you make a mistake, there are consequences to that. And there should be. That's a biblical principle. But the, the issue is, is sometimes people have a repentant heart in a situation. We go, no, no, no. You messed that up, and so that's who you are for the rest of your life. No opportunity for reconciliation, no opportunity, and what we do is we cancel them. We cancel them, and we silence them, and we label that person, and they'll never, ever change. That's who they are. And we cancel them. You know, in the age of social media, this is what it could look like is you just unfollow them. Maybe you've been there, and, and, and I think our natural tendency is like, I don't do that. I'm not a part of cancel culture. But did you know that every time we look at somebody and we give up on them and we don't see them as the way that God created them, we've canceled them. In our mind, we've said, nope, no opportunity for reconciliation. They'll never change. They'll never be different. You know, I was listening to uh, Sports Talk Radio on the way as I was driving back uh, to church this afternoon, and I was listening to a guy that I listen to all the time, and he was talking about Trevor Lawrence, who's one of the quarterbacks at Clemson. I love Clemson football, Dabo Sweeney. Uh, I think he's awesome. He's going to be a first-round draft pick, and he's a, he's a guy of faith. Trevor Lawrence is someone who loves God, and this sportscaster was really poking fun at his faith. And he admittedly said, I'm being sarcastic towards his religion and what he believes in. And my initial thought is like, man, I, I want to shut that off. I don't want to listen to that. And let me, let me be clear, like, I think that's okay. I don't have to listen to that. But you know what? As I was thinking through this message, and I'm like, man, I'm getting ready to preach on this, my natural inclination was not to pray for this man. This is a guy that was speaking about him that is clearly lost, clearly doesn't understand the hope that Trevor Lawrence has in a savior and a creator. And my initial thought was like, I'm just going to turn it off. And I did. But then I kind of had this Holy Spirit moment like, I'm going to take a moment and pray for him though. Because he clearly doesn't understand the hope of the gospel. 
And so I realized that even in myself, even in us, that we're all a part of that when we give up on somebody. Maybe it's you canceled yourself. You've given up on yourself. And the thing is, is culture might be saying, hey, I'm, I'm, we're, we're going to cancel people. Jesus came to cancel our sins. Culture might say, hey, we're going to give up on that person. That person will always be a you, a you name it. Whatever they are, that's who they are. That's their label. That's who they'll always be. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. That's a child that I created, and I can, get, I can forgive them of their sin. And so where culture wants to cancel people, Jesus wants to cancel sin. And this is kind of a theme that we see develop in Colossians chapter 2. And so Jared talked about, again, last week, being rooted, rooted and, and built up in who Christ is. And in verse 8 of chapter 2, it says this. This is Paul speaking, who was a, early, a leader in the early church. He's written most of the, he wrote most of the New Testament. It was a guy who was completely against God, then completely for him. Had a Damascus Road experience and completely had his life changed around. Where he was an enemy of the cross, now he's one of the greatest Christian missionaries of all time. And so committed and so rooted in who Christ was. And this is what he's saying to a group of people. He says in verse 8, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive. By philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. He's saying, hey, don't be taken captive. Don't let your thoughts run with, you know, you know where it says elemental spirits, another way you could say that, another translation would be elementary principles. Don't take the elementary principles. Don't take what culture is saying. What philosophy says, what these empty thought trains of deceit are, don't follow that. Be rooted in who Christ is and his train of thought. That that's the way that we should be thinking. That that's the way we were designed to think. And if we're believers, that's the way that we ought to think. Is that we ought to be rooted and established in who Christ is. Not being carried on with what culture tells us but being carried on with who Christ is. And this is Paul's statement in verse eight. And in the following verses, as we go down, we really see Paul lay a picture out of why we should follow this, of why. Why should we follow Christ? Why should we not give way to the thoughts of the world, but we should give thought to who Christ is? Why should we do that? In verse nine, it says, for in him, the fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In Jesus, in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. That G, here's the deal. That there's a lot of people out there that, that think, like, yeah, Jesus is a good person. I'm cool with that. Like, if you want to ha have your thing with Jesus, that's awesome. But the deal is, is Jesus was either who he said he was, the son of God, the son of man, or he was an absolute lunatic, crazy, you shouldn't even consider what he said because he claimed to be the son of God. So it's either one or the other. And, and what Paul is saying is here is he's saying, hey, listen, Jesus was both fully man and fully God. God in the flesh came to this world to save us of our sins. And he's saying in him the whole fullness of deity dwells. And if you are a believer and, if, and you have been filled with him, in verse 10, who is the head of all rule and authority, that you're complete. You know what that means is that you're complete in Christ. You're completely complete in Christ. That he, when he fills you up, that that's life as you're supposed to live it. That he's the only one that can come in and fill that void and that gap that exists in your life. That we don't need to listen to everything culture tells us and empty deceits and philosophies that are out there about life because we need to be filled up with who Christ is. Why? Because he was the son of God. And that be, if we believe in him, that he actually comes into our heart and we have the Holy Spirit guiding us in our lives. That's an incredible truth. In verse 11, it says, uh, I'm going to read this. And sometimes there's something, it's some things in the Bible that you get to and you're like, God, really, like, why'd you, I have a question for God when I get to heaven, all right? And, uh, and that question is, like, why is circumcision such a popular thing? Like, why do we see that in scripture all the time? You could have picked anything else, God, and you picked this. And let me tell you, I just had a son a couple weeks ago. It's not a pretty sight. I'm just going to be honest with you. And I have that question for God. That's a, I'm not joking with you. I legitimately am like, God, 
why? Like, but let, let's read this, and then we'll break it down. And you're going to see this beautiful depiction of the gospel from what Paul is saying right here. And so in verse 11, it says, In him, in Jesus, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. All right, let's break this down a little bit. Paul is writing to a group of people who understood the significance of what circumcision was. And so if we go back into the Old Testament in the Bible, right, the Old Testament before Jesus was on the scene, what we see happen in the book of Genesis, I would suggest if you want to know more about this, reading through Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 17, and you can kind of get to see, just read the whole book of Genesis, how about? You read the whole book of Genesis, you're going to start to see some of this theme develop. And so what had happened is God had a man named Abraham, and for whatever reason, God chose Abraham, and he told Abraham, it's called the Abrahamic Covenant. God told Abraham, hey, listen, I'm going to take you. You're going to lead a group of people. You're going to be in charge of a group of people that are going to grow in multitude and number, and one day I'm going to bless the whole world through you. And so we see that God, in the Old Testament, he chooses this specific group of people for a very special purpose. Why did he choose them? I don't know, but he did. And he makes this covenant with Abraham. And this is what happens is, is God tells him, that's in Genesis chapter 12, but in Genesis chapter 17, what we see is God said, hey, here's the way you're going to be recognized. This special group of people, this Israelite people, these Jewish people, here's how you're going to be known. Here's your gonna, how you're going to identify with me, that all of the males who are part of your tribe, all of the males who are, part, who are part of your people, they will be circumcised. They will out undergo this physical act this outward demonstration to show this covenant that they belong to. And so that's why circumcision existed. Why did God use that? I don't know, but that's what happened. And this is, he, Paul is writing to a group of people who would have had an understanding of that, or it would have been at least like culturally relevant to them. It would have been something that they recognized. Recognize. And so as we look at this passage, what Paul is saying is, hey, that was the old covenant. That was the old covenant between God and the Israelite people. But since Jesus came, he came to do something new. This new covenant with all people that every single person could be a part of. And what Paul is saying here is, listen, your own flesh, the sinful nature of your own humanity was circumcised, was removed through who Christ was. That spiritually you've been made new because of what Christ has done. Where in the Old Testament, this was a physical act to show and demonstrate this covenant relationship. What Christ has done, what he did to come and he died on the cross for your sins and my sins. That as he hung there, that what that happened when we accept Christ is we actually have the old removed. This sinful nature of who we are removed. And we're made new in Christ. And that's what Paul is really alluding to in verse 11. And in verse 12, we see it says, having been buried with him in baptism, having been buried with Jesus in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. That baptism, what that is, here's the deal. If you've never been baptized before, it's so funny to see that uh, in, in the New Testament, baptism is spoken about in a way that it's like, no doubt you'd do it. All throughout, like go read Romans chapter 6, and Paul speaks about the act of baptism as a thing that this as a Christ follower is something you do. What is baptism? It's taking, it's, it's being submersed underwater and raised back out of it. Why? Because it's a representation of the gospel. That Jesus was killed on a cross, he was buried in a tomb, he was placed in a tomb, and three days later he raised to walk again. That he, res he was resurrected. That's what we celebrate every Easter. That when we engage in baptism, this, uh, this outward demonstration of an inward transformation in our heart, that this is something as a believer, if you've never done, this does not lead to salvation. Baptism does not save you. But what it does do is it's saying to everybody that, listen, there was something in me that was wrong, right? Verse 12, there was this sinful nature in me but Jesus came, 
And he removed that from me. And I've been raised to walk in a new life because of that. And so I want to encourage you, if you're in here today, I, I, I talk to, with people a lot of times about baptism. And it's like this thing we want to resist here at High Street. We bring out this thing. We show a video, your testimony. And it's an awesome opportunity for you to share what Jesus has done in your life. And the thing that people misunderstand a lot of times is baptism is not about you. It's about what Jesus has done in you. It's not about you. It's about what Jesus has done in you and telling that. It's a step of obedience. So some of you are in here tonight and you're like, I want to grow spiritually. I would ask you, have you ever taken that step that is clearly laid out in the New Testament, in Scripture, that as a believer, that as you choose to follow Jesus, that you engage in baptism? And Paul speaks about it in this way. But isn't that a beautiful depiction, right? We have this circumcision of our spiritual flesh, of our sinful nature, that Jesus has removed that. And that we get to share in what Christ has done on the cross. That like when we engage in baptism, that's actually a, a, a representation. It's like, hey, we, we share in what Christ did for us. That's pretty amazing and pretty awesome and pretty powerful that, Jesus, that, that Paul says that in this way. And moving on in verse 13, it says, And you were who dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing, triumphing over them in him that you were literally dead in your trespasses. You were literally dead in your trespasses. But because Jesus came, you've been freed from that. And I wanna sit here for just a second. You're gonna be out here for a while, man. Thanks for coming up. I'm, I'm ahead of time, I'm good. But this is a beautiful depiction of like we were dead spiritually. And now we've been made alive with Christ. And as we look at this thing like a debt, the debt of our sin, the legal demands. I always think of this, whenever I went uh, to buy a house for the first time with my wife, and you go and uh, shout out to my guy Derek Cheney over at Mid-Missouri uh, Bank. He hooked me up with a home loan. He told me how much money I could actually get to buy a house. I'm like, hold up, did you? Uh, my wife wasn't even working at this time. Like, did you hear me like say how much I made and you're saying I can have how much? I was like, I'm about to be on MTV Cribs if I get that much money here. So I, I thought about it for a second and then I'm like, that amount of debt would absolutely choke and crush my family. If we bought a house that put us that much in debt, we would never be able to pay that back. Not without you know, killing ourselves to do so. And I think finances are a powerful thing because financial debt, the strain that you see from that and the strain that you've ever felt of having credit card debt or whatever it may be, like the stress of that, that's that debt. But our sin debt is way worse than that. That our sin debt is far worse than we ever thought that would be that we have this debt against us. And I, here's what I, I'm sure that there's someone in here tonight and you've been walking around in emptiness and brokenness and you're trying to figure things out, but you're like, I feel this heaviness, this sense of there is this weight on my life, this sense of there is this just burden on my soul, on my, on, on my spiritual being that I can't even describe. I would ask you, have you ever trusted in Jesus to remove the, the legal demands of your sin? Did you know that God is holy, that he cannot know your sin, that he cannot be a part of it? And so the legal demands of your sin are separation from God. Your sin separates you from God. But Jesus came. What does it say right here? That he canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And so my question to you today is if you're in here tonight and you've never, you've never accepted Jesus, well, no wonder you're walking around with this burden and this shame that you feel. 
because you never trusted in him to remove that and to nail it to the cross. And here's what I know happens as well. For those of you who say, I have a relationship with Jesus. Here's what Satan wants for you. He doesn't want you to know that your sin has been nailed to the cross. He didn't want Bryn to know that her sin had been nailed to the cross. He wanted her to stay in shame and isolation and hiding from it. That's what he wants for your life. That he doesn't want you to live that your sin and your debt has been forgiven. And I struggle sometimes as a believer to truly stop and believe that Jesus actually nailed my sin to the cross. Even this week as I prepared to do this, as I prepared for this message, Saturday night we were hanging out at our house and I was out back with my daughter and I left her on the trampoline by herself. Not a great parenting move. I'll be the first to admit that. I didn't think it was that bad. And as I thought through it, it probably wasn't good. I was outside, so give me a break. I was picking up some sticks that had fallen and I'm stacking them up in the backyard and my wife comes out. And she's, she's not yelling at me, but she's, she's mom talking to me, all right? You, you guys know what I mean? She's mom talking to me. I'm like, hold up. And what happened in that moment is I'm out, my neighbors were outside, and I was afraid that they could hear what was happening. And I mouthed something to her that was so inappropriate, and immediately I'm like, why did I just say that to her? Like, I'm supposed to be a pastor, I'm supposed to be someone that helps people spiritually. And I just said that to my wife. And that night and the next day, I just kept thinking like, Jesus, like, can you, can you really cancel that? Can you really cancel that? And in that moment of weakness, that mistake I made, I'm like, God, I, I almost felt like, God, would you eat? Why would you even want to cancel that? Why would you even want to take that away? I felt like such a failure, a phony, a fraud, a fake. And it was very hard for me to sit there and believe, but Jesus, like you, you, you died for that. You were nailed to the cross for that sin, that you came to cancel that sin. And it's a hard thing to believe sometimes. And you might be sitting here, and and whether you've ever accepted Christ or not, you might be thinking, Logan, if you only knew, listen, I've I've logged too many hours watching pornography. Like, I can't, there's nothing that can be done with me. Jesus can cancel that. Jesus has canceled that. I've had sex with one guy, two guys, three guys, four guys, five guys. I used to, you know, I've been in a homosexual relationship before. God, you know, Jesus can't cancel that. He can I've struggled with lying. Maybe you're someone in your, in, in your past, you just lied over and over again about silly things and dumb things, but next thing you knew, you were lying about every single thing that happened, making up achievements, making up how much money you made, making up stories that weren't true. And Jesus says, I can cancel that. You're someone who went through moments of rage. Logan, I fought people. You don't understand, I physically hurt people. Jesus says, I can cancel that. No, you don't understand, I slandered somebody and I gossiped about them and I said the worst thing possible about them and I hurt them so deeply with my words. How can I ever overcome that? Jesus came to cancel that. But I struggle, I struggle, um, you you know, it's hard for me not to drink. You know, but that one time at a party, you know, I, I took that pill, I did this. Jesus said, I can cancel that. I came to nail that to the cross. I came to forgive you of that. You know, I think sometimes we get in this season where we think that, you know, Jesus didn't come to just like be a killjoy and make us feel bad about what we've done. We should repent and we should turn from our sin. But he doesn't want us to live in it and to stay in it and to be stuck in it and to keep beating ourselves up over and over and over again. You can't be forgiven for that. What Jesus wants is he wants your freedom. And I think we miss that piece of the gospel sometimes, especially in the Midwest. Is that Jesus wants your freedom from sin. That is his heart. That is his mission, that he canceled your sin debt tomorrow, a week from now, two weeks from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, your sin has been canceled. It's been paid for. It's done. It's finished. It's over. 
And that every time when we fail and we make mistakes, what we need to do is not run from God, but run to God. We don't need to run from God, but we need to run to him and allow him to forgive us of what we've done, that he can cancel that. The only way you can go from death, from spiritual death, and deadness in your trespasses to life is through Jesus. He's the only one who can cancel your debt. That's it. And you got a, you got a sticky note as you came in, and we gave you a nail too. Don't lose your nail, all right? If you didn't get one, there's some up here in cups. We can get you one. And what, what I want this to be is a time where I think at times we undervalue the power of marking a moment. And I would say if you're in here tonight and you've been walking around and you've got this heaviness, emptiness, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, I've got all these things I've done wrong. Will you just like acknowledge your sin? Will you just write your sin on this paper? Maybe it's whatever it is. Maybe you're a believer and you're here and you're like, I can't forgive myself for this. I can't let this go. I can't believe Jesus canceled that. What is that thing that every morning you wake up that you can't let go of right now? Or maybe you're in a season and you're happy for a while and you're spiritually growing, but then you remember this. Well, I can't do this. I can't serve in the church in that capacity because of this. I can't do what I want to do with my life because of this. No one will ever love me because of this. I'll never get married because of this. I'll never accomplish anything because of this. And Jesus says, I came to cancel that and nail it to the cross. Now, don't nail this to our altars, please. <laughs> but bring this up here. If you want to, or in your seat, quietly, however you want to do it, what if you would write down that thing, that debt, that legal demand that you're like, I'm tired of carrying this around. And you have an opportunity to walk out of here lighter. You have an opportunity to walk out of here forgiven and a mode of repentance that Jesus came to nail the worst of our sins on the cross. And he wants to provide you that hope. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do is to bow your head right now. You can keep your eyes open if you want and just really take a moment and sit in that moment of like, what's that thing I'm not giving up? Am I having a problem with that right now? Have I ever had a moment where I've just acknowledged my own sinfulness, my own struggle. Don't walk out of here with that, that if you're feeling something churning up inside of you and stirring up inside of you, that is not because you just got an emotional pep talk. That is because the Holy Spirit of God is working within your heart right now and telling you, I want you to have freedom. I don't want you to live in shame and fear and doubt and isolation and hurt and pain, but I want you to have joy and hope and peace and peace about a better future. What is that that you're not letting go of? God, I just pray that as we um, get ready to respond in a moment of worship, we could be any, Jared said it earlier, we could literally be anywhere, but we're here in Springfield, Missouri at two, on a Tuesday night in October. For what reason, Lord? Other than that you wanna have a personal relationship with every single one of us. I pray for the people who are burdened in here, who are hurting in here, and that tonight could be a night where they let go that they would have healing. Maybe they need to come and they need to pray with someone who's standing up here on our, on our prayer team at the front. And they just need to confess and be transparent like what Bryn talked about. And they just gotta get rid of that. Maybe there's someone in here that needs to come and they need to turn and repent from sin that they've been living in. You've nailed it all to the cross, God. If there's anyone in here that hasn't accepted you, I pray that they would admit their sin and that they would call upon your name. God, we love you, and we thank you for the freedom that only you can provide. Hey, thanks so much for joining us for church today. If you made any decisions, we would love to hear from you. Text PRAYED to 94000, and we'd love to celebrate with you. We'll see you next time.